to introduce Dr. Anton Tremsin, uh, originally from Russia and then uh, spent some time in my home country, the UK, at the University of Leicester. And he's now up at the Space Sciences Lab uh, up on the hill. Uh, again, if those of you who come to Calde, uh, the, they, they do a great tour up there uh, next April, I'm sure that they'll be uh, showing people around the labs up there again. Uh, but Dr. Tramson has kindly brought some of the work that he's been doing up there at Space Sciences Lab down here to campus to tell us about this morning, and he's going to tell us about the uh, interesting new things that we can do with neutron imaging. So, thanks, Anton. Thank you. Good morning. So, I would like to tell you something about uh, the work we do at Space Sciences Lab, but not our main kind of work, because, of course, Space Sciences Lab is mostly about astrophysics and instrumentation and measurements, but I'll tell you about something um, of our main path. I will be talking about neutron imaging. And the reason I present you this because, is because we had some uh, technology which we developed for astrophysical instrumentation. And then we extended it to neutron imaging. And I would like to convince you that you can indeed can see a flower for a granite wall. So the neutrons have very specific um, features and, and uh, capabilities. So in the talk, I'll briefly explain you and compare neutron imaging with X-ray imaging because the, these are two complementary techniques. And most of you, of course, are familiar with X-ray radiology, but not many know about how neutrons are used for imaging. And then uh, talk about contrast in transmission images, sources which you would use for neutron imaging, and show you how we contributed to that field, and then show some applications of, of neutron imaging in di different uh, uh, branches of science. So, of course, of you, uh, many of you are familiar with X-ray radiography, and that's the technology which is used for many years since discovery of X-ray by Röntgen. And, uh, and uh, X-rays can penetrate quite thick objects, and we're all familiar from, um, with the applications in medical imaging. So, basically, you have a source somewhere at, um, and, and a detector, and an object is between source and detector. You measure the photons which are absorbed by the detector, and you obtain an image. And the soft tissue usually is quite transparent, and heavy Z elements are opaque. So what uh, the contrast in X-ray imaging is provided by the difference in um, absorption of X-rays. And the same thing will be with neutrons, but we'll have very different contrast mechanisms. So as, we, as is pointed out here, light elements like carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, are you, and which is a uh, consistency of most of our tissue, uh, are quite transparent. But the heavy Z elements are, are opaque. So the heavier the element, the, the, the larger is absorption. And of course, X-rays are used in many other fields, in addition to medical imaging, in, the, in non-destructive testing, in, in industry. And you can see inside of a particular um, um, uh, connector, you can see the, the defects in that. Airplane turbines are inspected. So the, this is the technology which is well developed by now. One of the things where X-rays are used is, is um, in art, and, and the reason I mention this is because we use neutrons for art studies as well. So in that particular painting, you can see that the, the underlayer of um, the painting de de depicts that the, the man was in a hut, and there was a, a, no beard in it. But what you see on the surface now is, is, is this painting. So you have a means of non-destructively discovering what is underneath and how this painting was developed and painted, maybe uh, altered at a certain, uh, certain time. But in addition to just normal absorption contrast, there are many other techniques in, in X-ray imaging, which we will also have for neutron. And in addition to just relying on absorption, basically you send a photon, it grows through the object, or it doesn't go, depending on the cross-section. And then you detect it with a detector. There are other techniques, and, and one of them is called dark field imaging, or refraction contrast imaging is another one. Because there are some situations where absorption contrast is very low, like in that case when the heart is imaged, in, 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 in the right picture here. So if you just do an absorption image, absorption image looks like this. There is not much of a structure because absorption coefficient doesn't change much. But what changes the refraction coefficient and then and, and, or phase uh, changes of, of the photon. And then they um, now can use a phase contrast imaging, which is a bit more challenging than just transmission. But we'll same, do the same thing with neutrons. Now, X-ray radiography and tomography, I'll, I'll mention tomography as well, is well developed by now. A lot of in, there are a lot of instruments, a lot of techniques are done. And sources are bright, they exist in our, around the world. They're love sources, they're synchrotrons. They're very, very bright. So why would we add neutrons? And what neutrons bring to, the, to this uh, field of imaging? 
And I'll try to show you what is, is unique with neutrons and why we use them. So first of all, neutrons and X-rays have completely different interaction with matter. So X-rays interact with electrons in the atom. As they propagate through the matter, they interact with electrons, and there's more electrons in, in, in a particular sample, there's more interaction, more absorption, more scattering, and so on. But neutrons don't interact with electrons. They interact with nucleus. And that's why the absorption contrast is very different for different materials. So what I'm showing here is a cross-section. So the diameter of each of those um, spheres proportional to the probability of neutron or x-ray to be absorbed. So the green ones are for x-rays and uh, red for the neutrons. And as you can see, for hydrogen, for example, which is the lightest element, x-rays have almost no interaction because there's only one electron. But neutrons have the highest probability to absorb of hydrogen. And at the same time, look at iron, which is on the right-hand side. X-rays can um, interact with iron very heavily, very strongly, and, and get absorbed very easily or scattered. But the neutrons can penetrate iron and quite thick amount of it and still can see hydrogen within an iron cask. So one of the demonstration images which was done in the beginning, they took a lead um, bucket and put flour inside of the lead bucket and imaged that flour within the lead bucket with neutrons. Of course, x-rays are completely blocked by, by lead. So that's why uh, neutrons can bring you some new possibilities and can be additional techniques for uh, studies where x-rays cannot be helpful. And other, material, uh, other uh, uh, atoms like deuterium and uh, oxygen, aluminum, silicon are shown here. So you can see it again. The contrast mechanism is very different and uh, neutrons can penetrate uh, thick objects which x-rays cannot penetrate. Another demonstration of where neutrons can be um, very different from X-rays, you can see here there's attenuation coefficients. Attenuation equals both absorption and scattering. So there are um, six materials shown here, lead, copper, iron, polyethylene, water, and oil. So as you can see, the neutrons, again, the, the longer the bar, there's a larger probability to interact for neutrons with that particular material. So if you have, let's say, one centimeter of iron, and one centimeter of polyethylene, neutrons will interact much stronger with polyethylene than with iron. So they will go for iron, but interact with polyethylene. And that's what's unique with neutrons. They can allow you imaging where you can look at the materials which cannot be imaged on any other way, non-destructively. So in, in neutron imaging, as an X-ray radiography, that's the same technique. You have a source. To be able to, to do imaging, you have to have a source of particles, of neutrons. And I'll briefly mention, of course, how we produce them. And then you place some collimation uh, optics because you have to have some sort of collimated beam for imaging or a point source. But the point sources for neutrons are not easily available. So most of the time, we use parallel beams. You put sample and then detector behind the sample. And then you look at the shadow. This is when you look at the absorption imaging. But there are other techniques like refraction imaging and, and um, phase contrast imaging where you use a little bit um, trickier setups. Oh, excuse me, Chris. I don't know, a collimator is not in my vocabulary. I mean, could you say a word or two more about what a collimator is or does? Right, I will uh, mention that when I talk about sources, but briefly, the neutron sources, they create neutrons in which are emitted in, in four pi in all directions. And if you have a, a beam which is, um, which has neutrons which go in different angles, you place your object and the detector at some distance from the object. But because the beam diverges, your image will have some blurring. And to preserve the spatial resolution, if some neutrons come this way, from that point they reach this point of detector. The other neutrons came this way, and then they, they produce image of the same point somewhere there, so you get blurring. That's why we have to collimate the beam and make it more or less parallel for neutron imaging. And especially if we do high spatial resolution. But I'll mention that more on, on, on when we speak about sources. So as I mentioned to you, with neutrons, you can interact with hydrogen. So what unique things you can study is one of them is you can look at the water distribution in wood. And you can study how water is absorbed by wood. Of course, wood is a, is a big structural component of many buildings. And how it interacts with rain and, and what is the speed of water absorption and what is the speed of glue absorption when they use glue in wood. Uh, and you can visualize it with neutrons. So what I'm showing here is a um, set of images taken at the neutron beam line. And you can see how water is absorbed by wood in a certain amount of time. And only neutrons can reveal that non-destructively again. Of course, you can cut the wood and see where the water is, but then you destroy your sample. In that case, we can do it non-destructively. 
and in real time, more or less. And another area where neutrons are used is in, in archaeological studies or uh, in our heritage studies. And uh, what I want to show you is just one of the examples from our colleagues in Switzerland where they stu studied the bronze statue. And in that case, it's not just radiography, not just one projection image. It's multiple projections, which then they reconstructed into three-dimensional object. And then it's called the neutron tomography, the same as X-ray tomography. But in that case, once you have a three-dimensional object, you can cut it, you can slice it in, in your virtual memory in the computer, and you can see what's inside. And that's what is demonstrated here. You can see, for example, that the blue is a hollow part of the uh, sculpture. Without cutting it, you can tell what's going on inside. And X-rays wouldn't do it because they would not penetrate. But neutrons do penetrate. Now you can slice it, you can open it, you can look where the different materials are, how things were added at a later time. And that's what is exciting for uh, archaeologists and scientists who work in this area. And a, 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 a very interesting thing here is that we don't destroy the object. Of course, when we do measurements with uh, very important objects, objects from museums, it's very difficult uh, to convince museum workers to give us sample because we cannot bring our source to them. We have to bring sample to our sources. And I'll tell you how sources are produced. Uh, but uh, once they bring it in, we have to take care of that. Uh, we have to make sure that ob these objects don't get activated. So I'll mention some difficulties of neutron imaging. But once you pass all of that, you can do studies like this. You can slice them open and look at different materials within them. And you can discover lead within bronze. And x-rays will not do that because they will not penetrate. So another object, which is, of course, very precious, this is 500 years old Buddha. And they wanted to study what is inside. Of course, this is a, 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 an object which we cannot open, cannot cut. And um, since it was produced so many years ago, we don't really know how it was done and, and what is inside. And if we put an X-ray beam, in that case, it's 150 kilovolt X-ray, which is very, very high energy X-rays. An image you would see in the middle demonstrating what is inside, of course, it will uh, penetrate uh, more or less uh, this, this Buddha because the energies are 150 kilovolt are very, it's very high energy photon. But then you don't see what is inside of it in terms of uh, the things which neutrons can discover. And as you can see on the right hand side, the same object put a neutron beam. Since metals don't interact that much with neutrons, but there are other uh, things like wood, dry flowers, paper, they uh, are revealed by neutron imaging. So again, these two techniques are completely complementary and of course, if you can do studies with x-rays, it's much easier to do. You would do it with x-rays, but in some cases, neutrons allow you to see things which you cannot see with um, uh, x-rays or other methods. And that's what allows scientists to see what's inside of this Buddha. Uh, this is another sample of, of um, um, a sculpture which, again, demonstrates what's the difference between neutron and x-ray imaging. Uh, and that. Uh, on the right-hand side, we can see x-rays. Again, this is quite opaque object for x-rays. But on the left, you can see that neutrons reveal the, the different, uh, 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 different contrast in that object. And they can show where things were added later, at a later time. Because, for example, bronze composition changed as, as, as um, different centuries, there's different bronze composition. And you can tell the differences and you can see how that uh, statue was uh, worked on later on. Another very important uh, field where neutrons are used is studies of uh, plants and how plants uptake water. So people who give talks in this, and uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Uh, Kaminati, he mentioned that uh, the, the, this is one of the uh, major problems, how we feed people. Of course, to feed people, we need water, and water is scarce in many parts of the world. And, and if we understand and optimize how roots uptake water, uh, then we can solve a lot of our problems in the world, it looks like. So this a uh, group of scientists, they study how water is taken by the roots. Again, because neutrons can interact with water, and then that's what you can image with them um, by new doing neutron radiography. And what they want to answer, of course, uh, how available is the water in soil to the plants, and uh, how and where roots take water from soil, and, and, and how roots interact with the soil. And they try to stress plants, they put it in dry conditions, they put some fertilizers and, and see what happens. So the way they do the studies, they put plants in, in soil in these aluminum containers. And as I mentioned to you, aluminum is almost transparent to neutrons. Neutrons can easily penetrate for aluminum. And these plants grow for a certain amount of time. Once they've grown, they bring them to the neutron beam and they can do imaging. So sometimes they go and back and do repetitive imaging. And these are two examples of uh, 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 roots which were developed over one week and after a four-week period of time. 
And as you can see in these images, the roots are quite well uh, imaged. So you can see where the roots are. Again, because neutrons interact with water, and they don't interact much with uh, um, aluminum. So you can penetrate. This is in situ measurement. And you can study how the water is, is, is being absorbed. And how you can study the water absorption, I'll tell you uh, a little bit more on this. So as you know, there are different isotopes for hydrogen. There is uh, hydrogen by itself, which is proton and electron. If uh, you add neutron to the nucleus, it becomes deuterium. It's chemically more or less the same, but it has very different cross-sections for neutrons. So you can see two left uh, spheres on, 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 on the bottom image. The hydrogen has a relatively large cross-section, and deuterium has quite small cross-section. So if you make water, not with hydrogen atoms, but with deuterium atoms, then you can substitute one by the other, and you can see the front between the two of them, because one of them absorbs neutrons heavier than the, uh, the, the other um, water, the heavy water. And that's by doing this substitution, we can see the propagation of the front where water is absorbed by roots. And this is the example of uh, one of the studies uh, where they looked at how water is absorbed by roots during day and during night. And it's quite obvious, of course, the roots would be uh, uh, taking water during day because water is evaporated uh, from the leaves. But then they want to see it in, in, in real experiments, and this is what is demonstrated here. So what they've done, they inject heavy water in, in the plant, and, and then the heavy water, since it absorbs less, once it's being transferred through the roots, roots become uh, uh, but they're less uh, absorbing because of uh, a cross-section for deuterium. And as you can see on the left side, during the night at 65 minute measurement, these plants didn't push that water into the main root. But on the right hand side, you can see during daytime, the rough right side part of the image where they introduced heavy water and the left side is where the heavy water was not introduced. This is the heavy water which was moved by the plant. So you can see it, it just moved through the roots up into the uh, main, uh, main root of the plant. So again, these are in situ studies and you can study how water is being propagated by the roots from, from the soil to the plants. And that's something is unique neutrons can do. Um, as I mentioned, also the neutrons interact with oil. They can go through metal and look where the oil is in metal. And that can be used for studies of engines. And this is being done now. So for example, if you want to look at the oil distribution within an engine, and of course, in that case, we use usually small engines, not really big ones. But then uh, you still can study whether oil is in your engine, if lubrication is correct or not. And, and, and this is something, again, unique, which uh, x-rays cannot do, because they will not you know, uh, show the oil. And on the other hand, you can also uh, sense explosives. Again, this is kind of scientifically driven applications, not for home security or other applications where you sense explosives because they cannot bring neutrons to many places and they're harmful. But once you need to study something, it, this image just demonstrates, you can see the gunpowder within the bullet. So neutrons penetrate metal and they interact with gunpowder, which is organic. And other you know, uh, uh, instruments and airbox sensors can be sensed as well. And these are tomographies. So in that case, the people, our colleagues studied engine and they did study in a stroboscopic mode. So in that case, they took an engine which is a full block engine, aluminum block engine. And then on the middle picture shows the engine being static. So the, the oil pipes are not filled with oil. This engine has not been run. But on the right hand side, you can see the image and you can see some of the oil uh, uh, being, being spilled to, oops. You can see oil in the pipe. So you can see this um, oil blob which goes into the piston. So you can, in real time, in a running engine, observe where oil is distributed and, and, and see uh, it within the metal block, which is aluminum engine block. Again, because aluminum is very transparent to neutrons. This is something unique, and you can do stuff. But these are just unique studies. You won't do it on every engine. Another area where neutrons are widely used now is, is, is studies of concrete. Again, my colleagues who are working in this area, and Professor uh, Whitman in Germany is one of the experts in the field, gave a talk recently, and I uh, used some slide from his talk, that the, the uh, amount of money was spent on structures and to fixing concrete and, and rebuilding things is, is enormous. So if we can extend the life of concrete, it will be, it will be very beneficial economically. And uh, the mechanism of concrete damage is, is through several uh, mechanisms. Of course, ice cracks in the, the concrete and then uh, salt, which propagates into the uh, concrete uh, then reaches the iron bars and then destroys the protective layers. 
But again, how you can study this um, non-destructively, neutrons may be very helpful here. So you can look how water propagates for different concrete mixtures. And these are five images shown here that they demonstrate how water has been sucked by the capillary forces into concrete. And then you can see where the front of um, water is and, and you quantitatively measure how much water is in your concrete and how long it takes to propagate and so on. And you can look at the uh, um, salt in concrete. And one of the other studies they've done, they actually developed a crack in concrete intentionally. And the way they've done the crack, they put a load, if you can see on image here, they put the load on the, on the concrete bar. They created the crack here. And then they put that crack uh, into a place where there was water at the bottom. And as a function of time, you can see there's two projections. One of them is horizontal, another one is vertical. And you can see in these two projections, quantitatively, they can measure where the water is around that crack, how much of it, and, and, and how soon it goes to which position. And of course, when this water reaches these metal bars, the, the steel bars, the steel uh, protection layer gets um, stripped off, and, and, and that's a mechanism for the failure for the concrete. So concrete studies is uh, one of the areas where neutrons are used. Now, I told you good things about neutron imaging, why they are useful, and now I should tell the difficulties of that, because neutrons are not as easy to produce as x-rays. They're quite harmful, and the reason I'm, um, they we're not using them very frequently, and uh, at least I, five, six years ago, didn't know much about neutron imaging, because they're very rare, so very unique uh, studies. So neutrons are dangerous to uh, any life um, uh, because they can cause a lot of damage. So you don't want to be next to a neutron source when neutrons are uh, running. It can also activate materials. So you can put some material in the beam and that material gets activated. So it becomes radioactive. Once you activate it, you cannot take it, you cannot take it away from the source. Some, some materials do, not all of them. The facilities which create neutron beams are quite expensive. And then compared to X-rays, the sources of neutrons are quite weak. They're 10 orders of magnitude less bright. And how do we create neutron beams? So if you want to do imaging, of course you need beam of particles which penetrate through your object and then you detect it with a detector. There are two ways of creating neutrons, two major ways. There are also portable sources, but they're not useful for imaging. So one of them is, of course, nuclear reactors, research reactors. Uh, and, and in that case, we create neutrons just in the nuclear reactor. Then we collimate it with the optics, meaning we just reject the ones which go in the wrong direction. We only leave neutrons which go towards our detector we place an object and then detect it behind it. So these beams are run continuously. Um, there are quite a few research reactors in the world, but very small amount compared to X-ray sources, of course. Um, but the other way of producing neutrons is through spallation. And I'll tell you a little bit more on this. Uh, in spallation, um, what you do, you hit the proton beam into, into a target, into some nucleus. And the proton beam is very high intensity beam, very high energy protons. They, accelerated in a big accelerator facility to 90% of speed of light. So this is a very high energy protons hitting nucleus, and nucleus basically just is ripped apart and neutrons are emitted in all directions again. Uh, so in, in, the, in the case of spallation sources, we can create pulses of neutron beams. So once they are pulsed, there are very interesting things we can do with pulsed sources compared to continuous sources. Um, and these pulses would be in the scale of um, uh, 30 to 100 microsecond in duration, and they would run at 50 to 60 hertz repetition rate. So on the left, there is an image of a, of a nuclear reactor um, a pool. This is where the, 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 you see this chunk of light, blue light there. And uh, on the right, this is just a, a few photographs of an accelerator-based facility where we do spallation uh, of neutrons, installation sources. So what happens when the protons uh, hit this mercury target, which is shown here, by, by an error. So that mercury is flowing here, and, 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 um, and that target is, is uh, the proton beam hits on the red the point here, and the neutrons are created and go in all four directions. And these neutrons, which are created here, and the nuclear reactors, they are usually high energy neutrons. So if we want to do imaging, we really need to cool them down. So from um, kilo electron or mega electron volt energies, we need to go to milli electron volt. And the way we cool neutrons is through interaction of neutrons with water or liquid hydrogen even. So, so neutrons, they're like billiard balls. They interact with hydrogen atoms, they lose their energy, and by the time they get many interactions, they become low energy. And this is mostly neutron studies done with neutrons which are thermal and cold energies. 
not, not high energy. But these are two main uh, techniques which we would use to create neutrons. So as you can see, these are very unique facilities. Not many of them exist, and, 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 and that's why the neutron studies are quite rare. Now I'll switch uh, to um, our contribution to this field. So you might think, okay, we talk about neutrons. What, what Berkeley is doing in that area? And I'll tell you how we get involved in this. So we, in our group, work on developing detectors for astrophysical applications, for synchrotrons, for bioimaging. And these detectors, again, are not replacing every other detectors. They have their niche. Devices which we build, they detect single particle at a time. And that particle can be photon, electron, ion, and since recently, neutrons as well. So we detect one particle at a time, and we find position and, and time of, of, of every particle. And from that, we can build images, of course. So one of the instruments which we built in our group is um, launched on image satellite quite a few years ago. I just showed you that this is technology which we worked on. Uh, and as you can see, this satellite was uh, observing uh, Earth aurora, interaction of solar wind with uh, uh, magnetic field of Earth. And this is the image taken with our detector, which was launched on image satellite, which is on polar orbit. And you can see the development of the aurora around the North Pole. And this shows the dates when it was measured. And this is a uh, that set of images on the top as well shows how the, the aurora develops in time, taken by that satellite. And I'll tell you how this technology works. Another detector we built, we're proud of it, was uh, installed by a last servicing mission on Hubble telescope. It's called Cosmic Origin Spectrograph. And uh, we, we were proud of it. What was it called? Cosmic Origin Spectrograph. Cosmic Origin. Spectrograph, C-O-S. There were two instruments installed and other um, um, electronic switches, but the, one of the instruments was our, and I'll show you the picture of the detector. So the, the detectors which were built, they used in different areas, different uh, fields of uh, science and engineering, and of course, they're, 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 since they event counting, they can be used for mass spectroscopy and astrophysics. We do synchrotron instrumentation here at Berkeley Lab as well. Uh, we do a lot of biomedical research, so from looking to stars, at stars, we look at uh, very small cells as well, and this one image on the right is shown uh, the image of the cell. I'll mention it briefly as well. Because in that case, since we're measuring time of every photon, we can do fluorescence lifetime studies. And this is very exciting for us as well. We're collaborating with our colleagues from the University of uh, Los Angeles. University of California, Los Angeles. And since recently, we use those devices for uh, neutrons as well. So the detector, which I take, I'll show you data we've taken with, it was built for uh, originally was built for adaptive optics applications. This is another area where um, channel plate detectors, which we, which we built in our lab, can be useful. And I would not spend much time, will not spend much time here, but if you can use adaptive optics, you can get resolution. It's comparable to Hubble telescope, but from the ground. The trouble from the ground astronomy is that there's turbulence in the atmosphere, which makes the object blurry. But if you have ability to measure this turbulence and, and, and provide information, or to the mirrors which can correct for it, then you can recover the uh, unperturbed the wavefront and get very uh, good images uh, with high resolution images. So what we've done here, we, build, we were working on a detector which would allow us to measure the, the turbulence of atmosphere with frequency of about a kilohertz. So what we needed here is a sensor which will allow us to measure the position of every single dot. And as you can see here for unperturbed wavefront, these dots are in a regular grid pattern. Once the, the turbulence in the atmosphere changes it, these dots move. So if you can measure how far they move from the center, and you can send this information to the segment of a mirror, which will then move by the same to correct for that uh, perturbation, then you can get unperturbed wavefront. So that's what we'll be, we're building. You have to have very high frequency, very high resolution detector for this. But then we transfer the technology to neutron energy. And as I mentioned to you, one of the areas where we build detectors for was uh, fluorescence imaging with, with life, within live cells. So we're looking here at the fluorescence. So the scientists excite live cell with a laser, and then they measure how much time it takes for the photon to be re-emitted from that laser pulse. And the resolution here, we need to measure photon, every single photon, at, of course with some efficiency. We don't detect every single photon which is emitted. Our efficiency is on a scale of 30% only. But we need to measure with accuracy of 100 picosecond. So that's a very, very uh, high timing accuracy for photons. And then we can provide both position and time, and that's why it allows to do the, the fluorescence uh, curves for the entire cell, not just for the point. So I showed you how we've done imaging in astrophysics and, and biological imaging, but 
how do we extend it to neutrons? So most of the technology which we develop here with very small change is applicable to neutron imaging. And I'll tell you how we do it. So detectors were built, they are based on microchannel plate. And microchannel plates are made from glass. So imagine this disk, which is not to scale. The disk would be kind of a couple of inches or one inch in diameter. And we have many, many holes. So these holes are 10 micrometers, you know, one fifth of the human hair. It can be as small as two micrometers. So a disk of this size would have 10 million holes. And each of those holes functions as a secondary electron multiplier. So if you look just at one pore, which is shown on the right, uh, in that pore we have one electron at the top, we have electric field from top to the bottom. This electron is accelerated, hits the wall, creates two electrons, and two electrons hit the wall, create four, and so on. And then so we start with one electron, we end up in, at the bottom with multiple electrons, thousand to a million. So we start with a very weak signal of one electron. It's very hard to detect one electron electronically because electronics noise kills you. But once you get thousand to a million electrons, you can very easily detect them. That's, that's, that's the technology we use. So we use channel plates which amplify our signal and then we detect with different electronics. Now, how we convert uh, this signal into position? So behind this channel plate, we can have one or two channel plates. Again, they're very thin disks, 400 micron to a millimeter in thickness. We place different readouts at the bottom. And these readouts, they, they, they can be different, uh, different types and have some advantages and disadvantages, of course. But what's nice about this technology, we have no readout noise. CCDs have readout noise because of the, the nature they, how they build. But since we amplify signal to a thousand to a million, we have no readout noise at all. So we get one particle coming in, we detect one particle. And, and we can tell both position and time with uh, 20 micron accuracy and 100 picosecond timing resolution. And of course, we can detect electron ions because once they hit the channel plate, they create secondary electron. And these second electrons, uh, we amplify them. Photons create photoelectrons. Now, how do we detect neutrons? So for neutrons, there was a very small change from the technology we worked on. And the change came from the idea which uh, originated from uh, England. The idea was to dope the glass with material which absorbs neutrons. In that case, it's boron-10 isotope. And that isotope interacts with neutrons. It creates two particles which go from, from this wall and, and hit the adjacent pores. And from that point on, they create electrons and amplify them. So from that point on, detection is just the same as what was done for photon imaging. So basically, just changing composition of the glass. And there's a company we work with, uh, Nova Scientific, who does this channel plates now. They changed the composition, uh, added boron-10 into glass. Now we are sensitive to neutrons. And in fact, we're very sensitive. We've got efficiency of 70% to cold neutrons, which is very unique for the neutron field. And at the same time, the event happens just within the single pore. So this pore, which is shown here, is again on a scale of a few micrometers, 10 micrometers. So the event stays within 10 micrometers. It, it doesn't go anywhere sideways, like in scintillator, where a light uh, spreads out. So we place this uh, channel plate, which are neutron sensitive channel plate above, above a particular sensor. In that case, I'll show you results we obtained with TimePix chip, which is a uh, chip which is developed by CERN collaboration. And that chip has a lot of uh, pixels which are running almost ind independently of each other. They can run at uh, 100 kilohertz speed rates for every pixel. We place our channel plate above it, and then we place it in the vacuum container. Detectors were built. They require vacuum. The microchannel plates, they need vacuum for uh, operation. And then we place it in the neutron beam. And these are the first images we've taken. So I'll tell you a little bit about tomographies. Maybe some of you are not familiar with it. How you get a three-dimensional object uh, from uh, a radiography. Of course, radiography gives you the projection. So basically a transmission of objects. So you get line of sight and the transmission for line of sight. But how do you get the three-dimensional information from it? The images of sculptures I showed you, for example. How do you get three-dimensional image? And the, the idea here is you take multiple projections. So you take an object, you take a projection in this angle, and then you rotate it, take another projection, and you do multiples. In that case, I'll show you 180 projections we've done. And uh, from 180 projections, you, you can mathematically reconstruct the absorption of every voxel in the object. Once you get absorption of every voxel in the object, meaning tiny, small volume, then you can get a three-dimensional object. So here on the right is a tomographic reconstruction of the data which is shown in the middle. And that's a small object. So what we bring to the field of neutron imaging, of course, there are other detectors and are very widely and, and well used based on CCD technology. But what we bring it into the field is a possibility to count neutrons. And I'll tell you why we want to count them and measure time. And we'll get high spatial resolution. So the object, the same one shown on the left, it's just a, a nut with a plastic 
uh, zip tie. But you can see here, you can now separate them because they have different absorption coefficients. Mathematically, you, you have these objects in your memory. You can separate them because you tell, okay, this is object of this absorption, this object of this absorption. Virtually, you can do whatever you want with them. So it's, again, non-destructive way of studying things. You can go inside, you can zoom in. So we just demonstrate here with a simple object that uh, the, 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 the power you have from tomography. Of course, the penalty, you have to take multiple projections. And usually neutrons, because um, uh, neutron radiographies are quite slow compared to x-rays. In x-rays, you can get data like this for three-dimensional in a second. For neutrons, we actually spend much longer time to get good, good statistics because our sources are quite weak. But then you get three-dimensional object and you can do whatever you want with it. So here are the examples we've done with our detector. Again, we're bringing in higher resolution possibility to, in, uh, um, to image uh, neutrons. And as you can see, this image of a flower, it's, uh, sorry, of a, of a fly, it's a very good Swiss fly. It's not as small as ours. But, um, that, that allows us to study a fly, and then we can probably see some different tissues. For example, behind the fly's eye, we can see nerve cells, we think. So we're trying to investigate what contrast mechanism can be done here. So if you do an image of the same fly with x-rays, it will be much higher spatial resolution, but the contrast mechanisms are different. So we're trying to find out niches where neutron imaging would be much better and gives us unique information which x-rays cannot provide. And as you can see on the left again, you can see the organic powder within the metal casing with quite high resolution because neutrons are not stopped by the casing itself. So these are just tomographic studies. In addition to tomographies, because our detectors are really fast, as I mentioned, we do counting, but at the same time we can do multiple uh, particles which are amplified by the channel plate and then we can uh, image them. So we can do stroboscopic imaging. So if you have objects which are really fast, changing in time, and in that case, we just demonstrated, for example, a spinning fan, a computer fan, and we place two objects on it, one the, the cross and the, and the square. Um, these are the objects which are made of cadmium, which absorb neutrons quite well. So if you do static image, you can see that the image is, is, is here, and you can do it very easily, of course, just static. But if you start spinning the fan, so what we can do, we can um, time tag every neutron we detected. Now we can tell, OK, group images to the position where they, they correspond to a particular phase of, of the fan spinning. And as you can see here on the, on the right, so this is, these are the images which were taken for uh, different phases of, 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 of the fan. So the fan is rotating at uh, 50 hertz, but we can still image it as if it's stationary. And we can see your different phases by doing stroboscopic imaging. So another thing we demonstrate that you can, again, study water in real time and uh, water in pipes, for example. And in that case, we have a water from a bottle going down through a pipe. You can not see it very well on the left, but here is an aluminum pipe on the left bottom of the photograph installed in front of our detector. And what we're doing, we're putting water and air bubbles in, with, in, in that water through the pipe, and we can image it in real time. And again, how we can see water with a metal pipe by other techniques, non-destructively, that's probably a very unique capability of neutrons. So we can look at distribution and, and dynamics of water. Um, another thing we tried to study was uh, uh, distribution of oil in the fuel injection nozzle uh, for a diesel car. Because again, people can look at oil distribution within the engine block. They can drill the block, put the camera, and see how oil is just spread out from the injection nozzle. But if we can optimize that process and find a better way of doing injection models, because sometimes the, this uh, farm is not uniform. There's some turbulence happens in, inside of, uh, some cavitation happens within the uh, injection nozzle, and, and oil is not uniform as it's spread out. So if we can see inside of the nozzle what happens inside, what causes these non-uniformities, uh, then we can uh, improve the operation of the fuel injection nozzle. And for that, we need to penetrate metal and still see oil on it. And that, these images show here that, we, in principle, we can do it. So you see these oil channels where the oil is propagated through the injection nozzle. And at the top, there is a valve which opens and closes multiple times per minute. And we can image that. So we've done dynamic studies. Again, we need more statistics. But you can see, again, very poor statistics yet. But we can see how the spread comes out and what happens within the nozzle. So these studies will be continued. Another thing we can do is look at the suit deposition. And this is the pressure sensor for a diesel engine. And with x-rays, you wouldn't be able to see it again, non-destructively, because they, they, they will not penetrate metal. But in that case, with neutrons, we can penetrate it. We can see where the suit is deposited. And that allows us to do studies um, 
non-destructively. Um, and I'll just demonstration experiment. We saw how water by, is being pushed by capillary forces. And you can see how napkin sucks up the water from a water container in real time again. So for that, we need a lot of neutron statistics. And, and of course, the sources are not very bright. So you can see kind of grainy images, but they're still um, uh, showing up where the water is. Now, I mentioned to you that pulse sources are unique because they allow us to do pulse neutrons. And one thing I didn't mention yet, of course, um, the time of flight technique, which we use for measurement of um, um, neutron spectroscopy, I'll, I'll mention a few words here about it. Um, so why do we want to do uh, measurements of transmission as a function of time? So neutrons, they don't fly as fast as speed of line, of course. So if we can measure the time of flight, Move as fast as move, not move as fast as speed of light. So thermal energy neutrons, by the time the pulse is produced, the reach of the checker, it takes from millisecond to, um, from, of course, microseconds to milliseconds. So if we can time tag every neutron, we can measure energy of the neutron. And I'll tell you why we want to measure energy of the neutrons which went through the sample. And one of the applications is to measure strain in materials. So of course, we're all familiar with the Bay Bridge accident we had when they get the, the eye bar crack. So the cracks are being formed because there are stresses in engineering materials and stresses they increase the probability of crack formation. And we can do studies with neutrons within the metals where the stresses are distributed and, and actually optimize the engineering structures how we can uh, um, uh, increase the durability of elements. Of course, we cannot do it on a bridge. We have to do a kind of fundamental studies and in, uh, invent new materials but then we can still um, use that knowledge when we build real uh, uh, engineering objects. So here I'm showing the transmission as a function of neutron wavelength in the thermal range. So the, on the bottom we can see neutron wavelengths and that on the left side you can see the cross section uh, of uh, neutrons uh, absorption. So as you can see for different materials, for crystal materials of course, for different materials, hydrogen will not have it, but crystal materials have very sharp edges as neutrons change the energy, the, the transmission of, of metals changes by, by, by a large amount sometimes. Uh, and, and, and the position of those, we call them Bragg edges. And the position of these Bragg edges is proportional to the crystal lattice parameters. So if you pick up, let's say, the blue curve is a nickel. Um, you can see at energy of 4 angstrom, there's a very sharp change in transmission. So if you take an image before 4 angstrom, will be quite absorbing. And if you go past function, the object becomes quite transparent. So by doing time tagging <coughs> neutrons, we can now, since we're detecting neutrons uh, with time and position, we can do energy resolved imaging. So it's not just in transmission in general. It's also transmission which depends on energy. So instead of measuring one image, we measure multiple images for different energies. And once we measure them, they, we can determine where the Bragg edges are. And if we know position of Bragg edge, we can tell what is the dis uh, strain distribution within the sample? What is the term cold, cold, cold neutrons? The, 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 the neutrons, again, they have different energies. Because photons, they have different energies as well. X-rays, they, they, they're high energy. Visible light is low energy. The same with neutrons. Cold neutrons are neutrons which are with energy of about 5 million electron volts, thermal uh, 25. So they travel with speed of 2 mi um, millimeters per microsecond, approximately. So, and, and the, the thermal neutrons correspond to energy of uh, uh, wavelengths of a few angstroms and thermal to one angstrom. So, again, energy dependent, this is the, the term, the kind of broad term, the cold neutrons are neutrons which are uh, with an energy of about 5 million electron volts. So now, if you take an object which is iron and copper, and you measure transmission of that object, so in different areas, you, I'll show you uh, squares of copper and iron, and you can see different color curves, the uh, blue and, and the brown. The brown is copper, blue is iron. So you can see the transmission of these materials is very different. So instead of this image, which is kind of gray image at the top, you can now get images which would be an, an energy dependent. And if you look in the area one, the gray area highlighted in this uh, graph, the iron is not absorbing much, but copper is absorbing. And in area two is vice versa, iron absorbing copper is not. So what you can do now, you can get the same object, but the image is black and white, white and black. So just having energy resolved imaging, you can do material dependent studies, see where different materials are, but more important, you can measure position of this bright gauge, and from that position you can tell the strain distribution within the sample. Because without detectors, we're detecting time and position, again, that's a unique thing, 
we find spatial resolution, and then we can tell in a particular pixel of our image what is the spectrum of transmission. And once we know the spectrum of transmission, we can recover the bright edge position. And from that, it's a little bit complicated maybe, but, but um, from that we can reconstruct the strain distribution. Basically, if you have a metal bar, if you try to uh, bend it, there are strains which are developed within the bar. And of course, at some point, it will just give up maybe crack or just uh, yield. And if we can measure distribution of the strain in engineering samples, we can tell uh, how the material is behaving, what, what is the structure there. And one of the cases with some studies here is, is they try to look at crack propagation in metals. So what they've done here, they have these metal samples. Uh, these are steel. <coughs> and they put them in, in, the, in the vise, and they try to pull them out multiple times. And the crack grows between these two holes. And you can see this red square. We looked at the distribution of strains around that crack. And as, as you can see here, the strain is, is, of course, the high concentration of strain just around the tip of the crack. And then it changes um, as it propagates. But now we can quantitatively measure the strain distribution. And that's something unique with neutrons. Because with x-rays, you can do these studies, but on, only on thin samples. For uh, thick metals, neutrons are unique. And this is one of the examples how we do the measurements. You can see on the left side, there is a vice where we pull metals apart, and then we can see how strain is developing in it. And we can do uh, studies of, of this braggage position. So you can see the transmission of the steel is changing dramatically. There are uh, sharp edges, how things are changing uh, in transmission. This is another example, just bent bar. And you can see the strain concentration within that bar, again, with high spatial resolution. Yes, question. Why does the stress affect the neutron absorption? That's a good question. These edge uh, positions, which I showed you, they are proportional to the crystal lattice parameter. So if, 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 if I measure for unstressed sample, my edge position will be in a particular area. It's proportional to the distance between atoms in the crystal. Now, if I put stress and uh, the atoms get moved further away apart or move closer, the edge position changes. And it changes by tiny amount, but, but this amount is actually very challenging to measure. They're changing by media angstrom. So the, the wavelength would be, let's say, three angstroms, and it changes by media angstrom. But if we, can change, if we can measure that accurately, and we can, we can find out what is the strain in a particular point. And of course, for that, we need to know sample unstrained first, and then we'll measure strained ones. And the, 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 the challenge here is that with what we measure, the source itself is broad enough in the beginning, so we're not getting really angstrom accuracy, but we do mathematical tricks by doing fitting, and we can recover our data, reconstruct data with really angstrom accuracies. Another um, application where we use our detector is in fuel cell studies. So a few years ago, there was a, a lot of promise for the cars to be powered by fuel cells. Um, of course, it's not happening now, but, but uh, this research is still being done. And in the fuel cell, there is a membrane where there's exchange of, uh, uh, of water, uh, have, uh, of uh, electron and oxygen happens. So in that case, we want to look at this very small area in, within the fuel cell. So we need very high resolution because this is the area of interest, these channels where the uh, water vapor is being flushed away from the fuel cell. And if they get flooded with water, then the battery stops operating. Again, neutrons are very powerful here because they can look at water distribution within the running functioning cell without um, any perturbation to the cell itself. And we just demonstrate here we can get very high resolution. And by the way, you can see here the screw, and it has very funny structure with white and black lines. So this is the refraction on the screw threads, which I did mention a lot about the refraction imaging. But in addition to just since the talk is about neutron imaging, to just normal absorption, there are other mechanisms similar to x-rays. We're following what is what's done in, in x-rays. There are other mechanisms where you can get image, contrast in your image. And the refraction mechanism is one of them. So there's phase contrast imaging, refraction imaging. These are techniques which are being developed, but they are trickier and, and harder to implement. So one other unique thing with neutrons, which I didn't mention yet, neutrons have spin, and they spin interacts with magnetic field. So if you have a magnetic field, you put neutrons through it, the spin of neutrons will precess. And we have a technique now which allows us to measure the magnetic field distribution. Basically, get an image of the magnetic field as it is shown here around the magnet. And, and this is non, done non-destructive. So this is, if you cannot put your magnetic probe in some area, but you can use a neutron Im imaging technique to demonstrate and quantitatively measure magnetic field distribution. 
So this uh, work was done by our colleagues in Berlin, and we followed that work because we do timing in addition to position. So what we've done, we looked at the magnetic field, which is changing in time. 3,000 times per second, it changes its amplitude. So it's AC, three kilohertz uh, magnetic field around a, a coil. And as we can see, the image is kind of uh, blurry, but because it, there's not much statistics. In that case, the, the challenge is we'll have to create a neutron beam, which is polarized, spin polarized. And then we'll have to get analyzer, which also cuts our uh, sensitivity. So, but in that case, we can see the development. The, the, this is a 300 microsecond duration movie. So we've taken multiple um, exposures, of course, to get that movie. But, um, but that's something challenging. So it, it's, in theory, what we should have measured is something like this. For different neutron wavelengths, we will have different interaction, for, uh, different spin precession. Since we're measuring the kind of polychromatic beam, all these combined together, that, that, again, I wouldn't go into details, but something to demonstrate here. We can measure magnetic field with neutrons, and then not just measure, but get uh, images of magnetic fields. Um, another thing I'll mention briefly is resonance absorption imaging. So far, I've been talking about neutrons of thermal and cold energies. Uh, but there are, of course, in the, in the spallation source or in the nuclear reactor, the, for that we would need a spallation source. The neutrons are produced of, of all energies. So if we use neutrons which are kind of high in energy, so the electron volt type energy, so a kilo electron volt, what they have, neutrons, they have very sharp uh, absorption probability uh, at certain energies. So in that case, what we can do, we can study different isotope distribution within materials. And in that um, image we've shown here is, is, is a belt buckle, which was a replica of an ancient belt buckle. And of course, there's bronze, there are different uh, uh, silver uh, parts in it. So what we can see here is a movie. It's a slice through time, um, time of flight, basically. Or these are slices correspond to different neutron energies. And at a certain time, like, like it's coming up now, you will see this black thing showing up, um, like, like this, they start flashing, this black. These black pieces are made from silver, like, like this now. So at a certain neutron energy, silver absorbs neutron, uh, neutron beam. And we can tell exactly which material, uh, even which isotope of a material is in a particular pixel of our detector. And for that, we need very high timing resolution. So again, non-destructively, you can sense different isotopes within your sample. And for, for this method, we don't need much of the material. So for silver, for example, we can see 20 micrometers of silver within centimeter thick object. And not, of course, all materials have resonances, but um, quite a few of them do. And as you can see here, instead of just an image, which would be a transmission image shown on the left, we can now get an image which is uh, very specific to a particular isotope. So if we just take an energy slice, where there's a resonance for a particular isotope, we can see it within uh, object, and that's uh, non destructive. And another thing we can do with our, this resonance absorption is we can measure temperature. Again, non destructively So these are experiments I'll show you here. It is for a particular uh, material, in that case, in Stantel, we get this very deep resonances, uh, de resonance absorption um, at certain energies. And these energies are unique for different isotopes. But what happens if we warm up the sample, the material, this resonance due to Doppler broadening become broader. And if we quant quantitatively measure the broadening of it, we can tell what's the temperature of the sample. So not only we can tell which materials exist there, we can also tell what are the temperatures there by doing this technique. So this is something unique with neutrons. Uh, and of course, all my work was done with a lot of collaboration. We've been very lucky to get to many different neutron sources and learn and work with all our colleagues. This is very uh, good community of people who helped us to develop this technology and, and get all these results, which I demonstrated today. And I would like to finish with this picture, which was taken of a, uh, at the Paul Sher Institute of a flower behind a granite wall, again, because neutrons can penetrate granite, and they can see flower behind it. Thank you, and we'll be glad to answer that. Exactly, neutrons are neutral particles, but they have spin. So if spin, of, if neutron beam is polarized, so only neutrons with particular spin coming in, the spin, if it sees magnetic field, it starts processing. 
and then what we do here is we um, uh, we parallelize the beam first, as it's shown on the left. So in that case, we lose at least half of the intensity. Half of the neutrons are taken out. Of course, we lose more. And then the, 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 the spin of the neutron precesses. And then we put analyzer behind. And if, if spin is aligned with analyzer, it's transmitted. But if it precesses, it gets no transmission. So by measuring the gray value at the, at the image, we can see how far the, the neutron precesses. And that allows us to find out what is the value of the magnetic field. So this precession will, will be proportional to the amplitude of the magnetic field and the time neutron spends in it. So there's two parameters. That's why we need monochromatic beam, ideally, to study the precession precisely. In this case. Um, I had a question very early on when you were talking about refining the focus in the astronomy examples where you get the blurring and that you can, you can actually measure how much off-center um, something is moved and then you could do a feedback but isn't there a delay in that so that by the time the feedback and the measurement of the displacement is, is displaced to a new place? That, that's a very good point. The, the, the feedback should be really quick. Try to find so it. it's a question of the ratios of the. It, this process will happen within. Uh, I guess I passed it. This should happen within a, a, a millisecond. So that's why it was challenging to build this sensor for us. I mean, other sensors exist. So you have to be able to measure it within millisecond and move the mirror within a millisecond. So that feedback should be very fast. Otherwise, you're too late, of course. Yes. So the, the, the turbulence likely is on the scale of the kilohertz. So if you're able to measure it and then move your mirror within a millisecond then you, you're catching up you fast enough, yes. And then you can get much better imaging, of course. Um, and uh, as we've demonstrated... And how fast can they move these mirrors? Um, they move with a kilohertz speed. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's the one. And then from the globular image on the on a, on a, on a here of a star, uh, because of the atmospheric vibrations, you can get something really sharp like this. So that's, a, that's amazing technology. Yes, you mentioned a number of materials. I was curious about how transparent um, glass, pyrex glass, and uh, nickel and So glass is quite transparent. It's silicon and oxygen, so they are not absorbing too much. So we can go for quite cheap glass. Um, um, nickel, I have to look into that. I guess nickel, depending again on energy, what is you trying to image? I think nickel has some nice dark edges. Um, and it has some absorption, but we, depending on what you want to study, we can discuss that and see if we can go to a thermal range maybe or a um, thermal range and see if we can get transpired or not. I don't know much about palladium. I have to look at the absorption cross section or scattering cross section. Yes, please. Yeah, I, I just have a question about the spin. So, when you describe the spin, is it actually the spin that is Not really. It's a quantum mechanics thing. It, it's it. There's no really. It's not like a soccer ball. I don't think we can easily imagine it in, in our everyday life terms. But but basically, the, the, there are properties of neutrons. There's a spin up and spin down. There's two uh, states of the of the of the neutron, um, and 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 they are equally probable in a normal neutron beam. <coughs> but it's not really spinning uh, physically spinning. It, it's. Exactly, it interacts with, yeah. But there's no charge involved in that. And, and I guess spin of neutron, I probably should learn more on this, but I just know it, it, it processes with the uh, rotation, uh, it processes with the interaction of the magnetic field. Yes, please. Well, some materials are activated by neutrons and they interact. So when you do something like a piece of art or something, you radiate with uh, neutrons, then you don't know what's inside it. That's a good point because once we work with uh, museum objects, they, they are very hesitant to any new technology, and this is most of the time is new to those people. So to prevent it, we don't flush it with huge neutron beams from the beginning. So first of all, of course, there are some guesses what is inside, 
and not that many materials get activated. Some of them do, and then what happens after absorption of neutron, they become radioactive, and they, they will become radioactive sometimes for a long time. Uh, but what we do first, we'll shine a, a small amount of neutrons, and, and then we'll look at what gamma rays coming out, for example. So we see what is being produced, and from that we can tell if, if we ex expose it to a large uh, amount of neutrons, will it get activated or not? And, and only, only after that, we continue with a full, time, full measurement. But there's a big, big, yeah, of course, there's a big question. Some of them cannot be uh, used by neutrons because some materials get activated. Yes, please. Um, so a lot of the problems with sort of deploying this more widely you alluded to in terms of you know, having to bring the samples to the neutron source or you know, not being able to study things like strains on a bridge in situ and that kind of thing. Do you think, uh, is there sort of a path for development of technology that will enable this to be made more portable or is that really not in the works? I don't think in the near future because the, the brightness of, there are portable sources. You can, uh, you can buy commercial sources which are portable. They create neutrons of 14 MeV, for example, and uh, 2 MeV neutrons, and then you can thermalize them. But the brightness of those sources is quite small. And if you want to look at strain, you really need a very short pulse. But once you get a very short pulse, the intensity becomes even lower. So for neutron imaging, it's challenging. But looking at the strain, and for, to measure strain, you really need to measure bright gauge position with high accuracy. You need good statistics. So it probably will be limited to the sources where you bring your sample into, but not to the field. But people talking about studying wood with uh, portable sources and, and concrete. So some imaging can be done. And of course, they do a lot of gamma activation analysis. And, and, and for that, if it's not imaging, you still can do a lot of things. But when you don't need imaging, you have to spatially resolve the structure. It's probably still be done at, at the stationary sources. Thank you.